tabernacle tonight as we look at the veil before the Holy of Holies where the Ark of the Covenant was located. It may seem strange, but we are actually in the book of Acts as we do this because we are looking at Stephen's sermon in Acts chapter 7, the sermon that ends in his death by stoning. I am certainly glad that last week when I preached too long, I didn't end in death by stoning. <laughs> Thank you all for being patient. And I was actually originally planning to talk both about the veil and the Ark of the Covenant, but I thought I probably can't get away with that in less than two hours' time. So um, tonight we will only be talking about the veil, which was in the tabernacle. And Stephen is making reference to that in Acts chapter 7, verses 44 through 46. Our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness, as he had appointed, speaking unto Moses that he should make it according to the fashion that he had seen, which also our fathers that came after brought in with Jesus into the possession of the Gentiles, whom God drave out before the face of our fathers unto the days of David, who found favor before God and desired to find a tabernacle for the God of Jacob. Let's pray. Gracious Father, once again we thank you for the privilege of studying your word. Your word is the final authority. Your word is truth, and as Jesus said, thy word is truth, sanctify them through thy truth. Father, we thank you that your word declares that it is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. It is through the memorization and meditation upon your word that we cleanse our ways according to the Psalms. And so, Father, we pray that as your word goes forth tonight, that it will not return void, but that it will accomplish that which you please and that it will prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it. We pray your blessings upon the word of God tonight, and that you would give us hearing ears and understanding hearts that we might believe and that we might obey as we sang earlier this evening. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Here in this passage that we've just read, Stephen calls the tabernacle in the Old Testament the tabernacle of witness. And as we have seen over the last seven Sunday evenings where we've talked about it, this was a witness to our Lord Jesus Christ. We're told that in the New Testament, particularly in the book of Hebrews, that every item in the tabernacle in some way pointed to the coming of Christ, in some way explained what he would do and who he is. We saw that clearly illustrated in the sacrifices and especially in the Passover sacrifice each year because Christ was crucified, sacrificed, 
at Passover. And Paul explains that he is the Lamb of God who is our Passover Lamb. We find that John the Baptist pointed to Jesus and said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Our Lord Jesus Christ is portrayed in the sacrifices that were offered at the tabernacle. We discover that in the tabernacle there were men who functioned on a daily basis as priests, and one of them was the high priest. Aaron became the first high priest, as we saw in the Old Testament, and he is a picture and a symbol of, truly a real man, but he is a, a picture, a foreshadowing of our Lord Jesus Christ, whom the book of Hebrews calls our great high priest, the one who ever lives to make intercession for us. And so as we looked at the various articles in the tabernacle, we also saw that they give to us a picture of our Lord Jesus Christ. In the outer courtyard, we had, first of all, the brazen altar. And this was the altar where the sacrifices for sin were offered and consumed in fire. The picture of God's judgment being poured out upon sin and the offerers had to bring their sacrifices to be offered by the priests there, slain, their blood was shed, and then consumed in fire upon the altar. It was made of brass, a, a picture in scripture of judgment. And then we moved from there farther into that outer courtyard where we saw the brazen laver, about the size of a bird bath, perhaps even as large as the, the fountain that we have out in the courtyard here. But a brazen laver, and the priests had to do ablutions, washings in that, before they were allowed to come in for service. And if they failed to do so, they were killed by God. We saw that the cleansing taking place at the labor speaks of the confession of sin. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. First John 1 John 1.9, you all know the verse. And then we moved into the tabernacle proper, and the, the first room of this goat-haired tent was called the holy place. And in that we saw three articles of furniture, but we move from articles of furniture which are made out of brass, speaking of judgment, of sin, and cleansing from sin, into three articles of furniture that are gold. We move from the judgment now into the area of worship, and the holiness of God. And as we enter in, we saw on the left-hand side there was the golden candlesticks, and on the right-hand side the golden table of showbread, and directly ahead in the middle the golden altar of incense of which we spoke last week. And if you draw a line between those various items, starting with judgment and going through the cleansing and then inside it forms a cross, a very interesting picture that is given to us there. The two items on either side in that holy place and then lining up those items with the altar of incense all the way back through the two brazen items in the outer court. And then ahead of that altar of incense where we cannot go yet tonight is the Ark of the Covenant behind the veil which separated the holy place from the holy of holies where only the high priest could enter in once a year on the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, with blood which was sprinkled upon the mercy seat between the cherubim, not only for the sins of the people, but also for his own sins. For the Old Testament priests were sinners like we are. Though they portrayed the Lord Jesus Christ, they had to offer blood for themselves as well. But our Lord Jesus Christ, the sinless one, offered only for our sins, and he offered a sacrifice on Calvary once and for all, never again to be repeated, because Jesus said on the cross, it is finished. And so we're going to talk tonight about the veil. What we saw so far about the altar of incense is that it was connected to prayer. We find that the scripture makes it very clear that the incense that was offered before God symbolizes and represents the prayers of believers. David said so in the Psalms. We even found it all the way down into the book of Revelation in Revelation chapter 8 and verse 3 where an angel comes and stands at the altar having a golden censer and there was given unto him much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. 
and the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. We saw in looking at the description of the altar of incense that it had very special spices and oils connected to it. We saw that the spices were used in the burning of the incense, the oils were used in the anointing of the consecration of the high priests and of the lower priests and also the oil that was used in the lamps. We saw that anyone who compounded that special compound for the incense and the oils was to be put to death. It was a holy compound, only made by the priests and only used in the worship of the true God. We find that violators who tried to imitate or offer strange fire upon the altar were killed. We saw it in Nadab and Abihu, actually sons of Aaron, but had not yet been consecrated, not prepared, tried to offer strange fire, and they died by fire which came out from God. We saw later others tried, Korah and Dathan and 250 of the very top princes of Israel, and they also were killed, the earth opening up and swallowing up Dathan and Abiram, excuse me, Korah and Dathan, and then fire coming out and killing the princes and then the censers which they had used being made as a covering for the altar. We saw that no strong drink was permitted while they were serving the Lord at the altar of incense. We saw that the priesthood also is typological of us as we serve the Lord and thus the prohibition against strong drink. We saw that only once a year on Yom Kippur the high priest would go behind the veil but, but he would have to let the incense first go before him before he would enter in lest he be killed. We saw the dangers of leaders who do wrong and people following their evil leadership and thus the people excuse their own sins and it was particularly so with this offering of incense. King Solomon did it first and then he began to do it for his strange wives who offered the incense before their false gods on the hill of shame which even to this day is still called the hill of shame. It's over against what is the Temple Mount, Mount Moriah, the place where the Dome of the Rock is currently located. Across the Gidron Valley there, there's another mountain besides the Mount of Olives. And it's called still today the Hill of Shame because there Solomon built houses for his pagan wives and actually burned some of their children to death to the pagan gods of Moloch, Remphan, and others. We saw that Jeroboam introduced incense into his false worship on his copy altar of the altar in Jerusalem. We saw eventually that practice turn the hearts of the people into serving the false gods. So much to learn. We saw the false worship in the house of God in the days of Jeremiah and in the days of Ezekiel where the women were burning incense to the Queen of Heaven. The men were burning incense to the Queen of Heaven. Even the elders of Israel in Ezekiel chapter 8 were burning incense to false gods and God condemned them for it. It's a strong warning in terms of the way in which we come into the presence of God when we come in our prayer life, when we come with unconfessed sin and try to go ahead and ask God for things. A serious warning against us. We saw the appropriate use in the New Testament Zacharias, the father of John the Baptist, as Zacharias was fulfilling his office as a priest and the lots were cast and he got the job of burning the incense, he went into the temple of the Lord and the whole multitude, Luke chapter 1, of the people were praying without at the time of incense. And there appeared unto him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. Zacharias traced his lineage all the way back to Aaron, the high priest. And the angel told him, you remember, that he was going to be the father of a very special child, his wife Elizabeth, who was barren. And both these people were, were old people. They'd never had any children. But miraculously, when Zacharias went home, Elizabeth conceived and bore John the Baptist the one who is the forerunner of the Lord Jesus Christ, fulfilling the great prophecy of Isaiah chapter 40. Dear people, God keeps his word. And all these things that were prophesied in the Old Testament are now coming to fulfillment 
in the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I think it is no strange thing that the one who was to be the forerunner of Christ, it was his father who was offering incense, who had a prayer in his heart that God would give him a son. It was there that God began to fulfill the promises of the coming Messiah. Elizabeth, the wife of Zacharias, was a cousin of Mary, the mother of our Lord Jesus Christ. Fantastic pictures that are given to us as we look at this altar of incense directly before the veil, which separated it from the holiest of all, the holy of holies, where only the high priest could go once a year. And that's what brings us to the veil tonight. In Exodus chapter 26, verses 31 and following, it says, Thou shalt make a veil of blue. We've already studied the various colors that are in the tabernacle and saw that blue speaks to us of heaven and of deity. This veil is going to somehow portray the deity of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's a woven veil. We know that at the time of Christ, the veil that stood in the temple between the holy place and the holy of holies was as thick as a man's hand. It was not a flimsy little curtain. It was a very thick, heavy veil. Very difficult to push aside even by the high priest who went in once a year. Probably five inches thick. And it's woven all the way from the top to the bottom with these colors, the blue and purple, which speaks, as we saw, of royalty, and scarlet, which speaks of the blood of the sacrifice. All these we've studied already. And the fine twined linen, we've looked at that and saw that it speaks to us typologically of humanity, of cunning work. With cherubim shall it be made. The cherubim, you remember, the karuvim means the covering ones. Inside there was the Ark of the Covenant, and it was a gold box with a solid gold lid that had two cherubim that overshadowed it, facing over the top of that golden plate on the top, which was called the mercy seat. The mercy seat. We'll be talking about that next week. But also depicted on the curtain were cherubim, the covering ones. These are the angels that guard the throne of God. As we study in the Old Testament, we find two classes of angels. We find the cherubim and the seraphim. The seraphim, seraphim, means the burning ones. Cherubim means the covering ones those that hovered over and protected the very throne of God himself. Fascinating that we should see them thus on the veil that separates even the high priest except on the Day of Atonement from coming behind that veil into the presence of God lest they be slain. And thou shalt hang it upon four pillars of shittim wood overlaid with gold. Their hooks shall be of gold upon four sockets of silver. So you've got this gigantic curtain on four pillars and it, it touches only gold and silver. And thou shalt hang it upon, up the veil up under the attaches, that is the attachments, that thou mayest bring it in thither within the veil, the ark of the testimony. And the veil shall divide unto you between the holy place and the most holy. And thou shalt put the mercy seat upon the ark of the testimony in the most holy place. The mercy seat, a detachable lid for this gold-covered box, and inside the gold-covered box, as we have read before, we find the tables of the law, we call them the Ten Commandments, in stone from Mount Sinai. We find Aaron's rod that budded, and you will recall that story, and we find a pot of manna that the children of Israel had in the wilderness. And yet that is the one pot of manna in all of history that did not decompose overnight. God was reminding Israel of what he had provided for them. And we'll talk about the meaning of those things and the words of our Lord Jesus Christ specifically in relation to those things, the Lord willing, next week. 
we find that there was limited access behind the veil. Leviticus 16 and 17 deal with Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. And in Leviticus 16, 2 it says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Speak unto Aaron thy brother, that he come not at all times into the holy place within the veil before the mercy seat, which is upon the ark, that he die not. For I will appear in the cloud upon the mercy seat. Even Aaron the high priest couldn't go back there except on Yom Kippur. I love the last phrase of that verse. I will appear in the cloud. That's the Shekinah glory upon the mercy seat. I love it so much that I had that phrase engraved in Hebrew on my wedding ring. Be'anan era'e al hakaporet. And after that final word, I had engraved here the cross. We'll discover next week, as we look at the mercy seat, that that refers to our Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. The book of Hebrews tells us so. The Greek word is hilasterion. He is our hilasterion. It's translated propitiation. But that is the word that is used to describe the mercy seat. In the cloud, the Shekinah glory of God. God himself says, I will appear on the mercy seat. And he tells us in the New Testament that is the cross. And that's why I had it engraved on my wedding band, which I have worn for more than 39 years. On my wife's wedding band is engraved the Hebrew phrase, Yahweh Yeshuati, means Jehovah is my salvation. And on either side are crosses on that phrase. That phrase can also very legitimately be translated, my Jesus is Jehovah. Dear people, when we look at the tabernacle and all of its accoutrements and all of the functions of the priests and all of the sacrifices, and the fact that God himself was dwelling in the midst of his people as Jesus, though veiled in flesh, was God dwelling in the midst of his people. John chapter 1 verse 14. And we beheld his glory. That's the Shekinah. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. As we see that the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, that's he pitched his tent, skene. It takes us back to the tabernacle. He pitched his tent among us. He dwelt among us. We know that as we look at the tabernacle, we are looking at the visible picture that God gave to the Jews to understand about the coming of their Messiah, the one who is now, through faith in him, our Savior. He could only enter in on Yom Kippur. Leviticus 16, verses 12 and 15. He shall take a censer full of burning coals of fire from off the altar before the Lord, and his hands full of sweet incense beaten small, and bring it within the veil. Then shall he kill the goat of the sin offering that is for the people, and bring his blood within the veil, and do with that blood as he did with the blood of the bullock, and sprinkle it upon the mercy seat, and before the mercy seat. Yom Kippur, one day, multiple entrances behind the veil by the high priest as he came in to fulfill symbolically all that Jesus Christ as our great high priest has done for us before the very throne of God. In the New Testament, the veil is mentioned seven times. That's the number of perfection, the number of completeness in Scripture. And the symbolism of the veil is specifically stated and described for us. It's rather interesting that the veil is mentioned 
in the three synoptic gospels, that's Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Very interesting, it is not mentioned in the gospel of John. We would have perhaps thought that in John's gospel, which is filled with symbolism, and much of the symbolism that we see from the tabernacle is found in the gospel of John, John does not emphasize the veil as the other three gospel writers do. We've already seen in our study of the Gospel of John that it had a very specific purpose. John explains to us in the final chapter the reason that he wrote what he wrote. And the reason that he chose the various miracles and signs done by our Lord Jesus Christ that he chose. Different from the Synoptic Gospels, which all follow a parallel narrative and have a different set of signs in them. And of course, Jesus did much more than what we see even in the Gospels, all four together, because we're told that many other things truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples. But John explains to us in the very next phrase, but these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. John is presenting our Lord Jesus Christ as the one who can save us. The reason for the narrative that John gives and the different miracles that he records for us that Jesus did is specifically to help us understand that Jesus is our Savior. There is no other Savior. You cannot get to heaven by your good works. You cannot get to heaven by your parents' good works. You cannot get to heaven by your church membership. You cannot get to heaven by your baptism or confirmation or partaking of the Lord's table. You must come to Christ. There is no salvation outside of him. These are written that she might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, emphasis on his deity as we find all the way through the Gospel of John. And so, as we look at these different passages dealing with the veil in the Synoptic Gospels and then in the Epistles, we need to ask ourselves, what is it that God is trying to teach us? The first passage is in Matthew chapter 27. It's the scene of the crucifixion, beginning in verse 46. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani! That is to say, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Some of them that stood there when they heard that said, This man calleth for Elias. And straightway one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him to drink. The rest said, Let be. Let us see whether Elias will come to save him. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the voice, the ghost. Now verse 51, here's our key verse. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. And the earth did quake and the rocks rent. Remember the veil in the temple was about five inches thick. It was hung loosely, would not normally tear during an earthquake. The temple didn't fall down, there was an earthquake, rocks were torn open, but significantly the veil was torn from the top to the bottom. It wasn't merely torn a little bit, it was torn in two pieces. It opened up a view of the Holy of Holies. No longer was the Holy of Holies and the Ark of the Covenant invisible to everyone. It suddenly became visible to all. The earth did quake and the rocks rent and the graves were opened and many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. Now when the centurion and they that were with him watching Jesus saw the earthquake and those things which were done, they feared greatly, saying, 
Truly, this was the Son of God. The first mention of the veil in the New Testament is at the crucifixion, at the death of our Lord Jesus Christ. We see that same narrative given to us in Mark, and it's interesting that Mark indeed includes the same thing and gives us a little extra information. At the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is being interpreted, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And some of them that stood by when they heard it said, Behold, he calleth Elias. And one ran and filled a sponge full of vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him to drink, saying, Let alone, let's see whether Elias will come and take him down. And Jesus cried with a loud voice and gave up the ghost, and the veil of the temple was rent in twain. That means two pieces, from the top to the bottom. And when the centurion, which stood over against him, saw that he so cried out and gave up the ghost, he said, Truly, this man was the Son of God. A very brief passage in Luke. It was about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. And the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was rent in the midst. When Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. The cross... The picture of the death of Christ, the final and finished sacrifice for sin, the foundation of our faith, for without the shedding of blood there is no remission according to scripture, no sending away of sin, the death of the God-man the Lord of heaven, having come to earth and taken upon him sinless flesh and being put to death by sinners and for sin, the fulfillment of the Passover sacrifice, whereby God made the way plain for Israel to leave Egypt, our Lord Jesus Christ, and the tearing of the veil. Let me read you three passages out of the book of Hebrews. First from Hebrews chapter 6, beginning in verse 16. For men verily swear by the greater. He's speaking here of promises that God has made. And now he's giving an illustration of them. And an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife. They have an argument between them that has separated them, that it, no longer there is fellowship, and so they make a covenant. And in the making of that covenant, they swear an oath, a promise that certain things will be for party A and certain things will be for party B. It's an end of all strife. Now you recall man has been separated from God. It takes us all the way back to the days of Adam and Eve and their disobedience in the garden in Genesis 1, 2, and 3. And man has been separated from God by sin. There at the very beginning, God provided a blood sacrifice. Adam and Eve had covered themselves with vegetation, but God clothed them with skins of an animal, and I suspect probably of a lamb. Because without the shedding of blood, there's no remission. And you and I, descended from Adam and Eve, our first parents, are born dead in our trespasses and sins. Born in need of salvation. It's not by works of righteousness that we've done. No matter what we've done, it's not good enough that he saved us. There had to be the shedding of blood, and there had to be the shedding of blood that was eternal. That could take away the eternal stigma and stain and death brought on by sin. 
Our Lord Jesus Christ spoke of Adam as a real person. The Apostle Paul speaks of Adam as a real person and explains, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Romans chapter 5, verses 12 and verse 19. He explains to us that unless there was a real Adam, unless there was a real fall, then men are not sinners by nature. If men are not sinners by nature, they do not need a savior. If they do not need a savior, Jesus Christ is irrelevant. Christ came into the world, the scripture tells us, to save sinners. You see, that's one of the great attacks that is going on today in the world. The denial of the creation narrative because men do not want to consider themselves to be sinners. So they have to come up with a different alternative and thus evolution. You see, if evolution is true, then we have no accountability to a God. Number one, to a God who made us. Number two, to a God who wants to save us from our sins. And so here we find wherein God, willing to abundantly show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath. Men go through this process when they sign contracts. God said, I want to show you that this is never going to change. Men break contracts. Men break covenants as they did in the Old Testament. But my promise is immutable. That is, it does not change. God, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise, that's you and me if we are Christians, the immutability of his counsel, the things that God planned in eternity past, the sovereign counsels of God in the dark recesses of eternity past, confirmed it by an oath that by two things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. God's oath and God's person himself, the two immutable things which make it impossible for God to lie. That gives us a strong consolation, those of us who have fled for refuge to lay hold on the hope set before us. We talked about those who, in times of distress, when they were being pursued by a goel, a kinsman redeemer, bent on avenging the blood of someone who had been killed, would run into either the tabernacle or later the temple and lay hold on the horns of the altar until it could be determined whether they were guilty or not guilty. Here we are, running in, grabbing hold of the horns of the altar, the horns where the blood has been sprinkled. A sacrifice has been made, and it gives us hope, which hope we have is an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast. Now listen to the last phrase of verse 19, because it's what ties us into our text for tonight. And which entereth into that within the veil. It was the high priest who would make atonement for the sins of the people on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, once a year, when he went in behind the veil. We've already seen our Lord Jesus Christ as our high priest, the one who, with the altar of incense, brings the incense, the prayers of the saints behind the veil before the very throne of God. But there's more to it than that. Here they are going behind the veil, whether the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus made an high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Oh, I wish we could speak on that subject tonight. You've heard me say a few things about Melchizedek in the past. 
But here it tells us clearly that Jesus is the high priest, the one who is entering within the veil on our behalf when we have fled for help to him. The next passage that mentions the veil is in Hebrews chapter 9. Then verily, the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle made, the first, wherein was the candlestick and the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And we have already spoken of each of those articles of furniture. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, that's the holy of holies, which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant over a round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna, and Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables of the covenant, and over it the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat, of which we cannot now speak particularly. Now when these things were thus ordained, the priest went always into the first tabernacle, that is, into this first section of the tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. But into the second went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. The Holy Ghost, now listen to verse 8 carefully, the Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing. The word signifying means giving it as a sign. The Holy Ghost was giving us a sign or a symbol that the way into the Holy of Holies was not yet available to all, but only to the high priest. It was not yet made manifest. Manifest means to open up or to expose. What happened when Christ died on Calvary? The veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. The way it was made manifest. But there in the Old Testament, it wasn't yet made manifest. Which was a figure for the time then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience, which stood only in meats and drinks and diverse washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. But Christ, being come and high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of bulls and goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. We're at the tabernacle, people. We're at the temple. It's Jesus Christ, our great high priest. And this, the writer of Hebrews tells us, was the picture of Christ, the high priest. The picture of Christ, the bleeding sacrifice, not with the blood of bulls and goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place. You remember part of that procedure on Yom Kippur was the priest would go with the incense. And then the priest would come in with the blood of the sacrifices and touch the horns that were on the corners and sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat speaks to us of the blood of Jesus Christ, shed for the remission of sins, to purchase our redemption, we're told in verse 12, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh. And oh how I love verse 14, the very next verse. You see, those Old Testament sacrifices could never purge the conscience. In the Old Testament, it was the Day of Atonement. Atonement, kafar, means a covering. The sin had not yet been permanently dealt with. The sin was not sent away completely. The sin was still there, and people still had the sin in their consciences. It was a temporary reprieve until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
And here's what verse 14 tells us about the conscience. The blood of bulls and goats could never cleanse the conscience, but listen to verse 14. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? We've talked about serving God, and the principal way in which we do that is through our worship of Him. But we come with things on our conscience, guilt from past sin. And every time we want to serve, the devil grabs hold of that, shakes us around and says, Oh, don't you remember this? You can't serve God. Think about the wicked things that you have done. The blood of Jesus Christ not only cleanses us from all sin, as we see in 1 John, but the blood of Christ purges our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. What joy, what delight has your conscience been purged? There is only one thing that can do it, and that is the blood of Jesus Christ. He goes on, For this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, that is, the law, that by means of death that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Friends, have you ever received that? That promise of the internal inheritance, eternal inheritance have you ever truly trusted Jesus Christ alone leave you if you're trying to say well I trust Jesus plus I trust my church membership or I trust Jesus plus I trust my baptism or I trust Jesus plus I trust my confirmation or I trust Jesus plus the fact my parents were Christians I trust Jesus, but I trust the church also to get me to heaven. That's like walking halfway across a bridge and deciding you're going to step out into space to get the rest of the way. It won't happen. You have to trust the bridge and the bridge alone to get you from one shore, the shore of the lost, to the shore of the saved. From eternal condemnation to eternal salvation, there is only one bridge, and it is Jesus Christ. That's the whole point of the New Testament. You cannot get there by the law. You can only get there by the blood of Christ. And that's what he says in the next verse. For where a testament is, and those of you who know anything about law know that you have to have a last will and testament if you want to pass things on without the state deciding where this stuff is going to go. If you have a last will and testament, what has to happen for it to take force? You have to die. And that's what he says here. For where a testament is, there must also be of necessity the death of the testator. For a testament is of force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. In other words, you can write a last will and testament, and all those greedy relatives cannot come in and take your stuff and divide it up as long as you're alive. The only way they can do it is when you're dead. And then the testate, testament goes into full force and effect. But not until you breathe your last breath. You know, you can change your will. You can change your will 45 times if you want. I knew a lady once, long ago, when we were ministering up in North Jersey. Uh, she was somewhat deaf, but not too deaf. But she made out as though she were really, really deaf. So that she could hear what... Her children and her grandchildren were saying. And she frequently came to me and told me, Pastor, I have changed my will again because I heard so-and-so say such-and-such. She delighted in doing that. Her will didn't go into effect until she died. And who knows what it was saying by that time. But God has sworn an oath that he will not change. And the one who has made the testament has died. Even our Lord Jesus Christ. So the promise of the inheritance 
is ours when we place our faith in Jesus. You can't get into the will by some other way. You can't go down to the courthouse and say to the judge, Hey, you know, I'd like to put my name in there for that million dollars that was left to somebody else. It's only for those who are in the will. How do you get into the will? You trust Christ. You trust him alone. Oh, how I wish we had time to go through the rest of this text. Perhaps we will next week, for it talks about Christ entering into the holy place, not made with hands, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. You see, the Holy of Holies speaks of moving directly into the presence of God in heaven. But we'll save that for next week. And then we get to Hebrews chapter 10. And it tells us exactly and specifically what the veil is symbolizes and represents. Beginning in Hebrews 10:19, having therefore brethren boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. We're moving behind the veil now, we're moving into the holy of holies. Verse 20, listen carefully, by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil that is to say, his flesh. You see, the body of our Lord Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of the typology of the veil. And when his body was rent on the cross, and when he released his spirit by an act of the will, separating body from spirit, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from top to bottom. And he has made available for us direct access into the very presence of God by his death on the cross. The veil, that is to say, his flesh. And so now we have the access, and here is what Paul tells us. He says, and having an high priest over the house of God, let us draw near. You can draw near to God. The veil no longer stands between you and him. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance, not of works, not of law, in full assurance of faith. That is the cry of the Reformation. The just shall live by faith. That is what gave Martin Luther courage as he stood before the Diet of Worms. The just shall live by faith. And he wrote in the margin of his Bible, Sola, alone. We now can enter into the very presence of God. Through the blood of Jesus Christ, the veil has been torn in two. So don't give up. That's what he tells you in the next verse. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. For he is faithful that promised. What does the veil speak to us of? This marvelous portion of the tabernacle. It speaks to us of the body of Christ. Rent and torn for us. On Calvary's cross. The veil was also sprinkled with blood. Not merely blood on the other articles of furniture, not merely blood on the hilasterion, the mercy seat, but the veil was sprinkled with blood. And here we're told, this is the flesh of our Lord Jesus Christ, torn for us, that now we might have direct access and we can come boldly under the throne of grace whereby we may find grace and mercy to help us in time of need. Do you understand why Stephen in his sermon in Acts chapter 7 tells us that this is the tabernacle of witness? And when we looked at that word witness many weeks ago we saw that it is a word that is used to speak throughout the New Testament of a testimony to Jesus Christ. 
the tabernacle given 1,445 years before our Lord Jesus Christ came on earth, given to Moses by direct revelation, given after the Exodus so that the children of Israel might have their eyes focused on the coming Messiah, that they might know who he is and what he would do, that they might have, like a child has, a picture book to understand what their Messiah would be like. And here is the veil, the high priest going behind it with the incense, with the blood, and then the veil being torn so that we might, through our great high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ, have direct access to God. It's a beautiful picture. It's a picture not of our works, but of the gift of God. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you once again for your word. The serious study of your word and the way in which the New Testament unfolds all of those things that were written in the Old Testament concerning our Lord Jesus Christ. For it all speaks of him. As he said on the road to Emmaus, as he was walking with the two, he unfolded unto them all the scriptures concerning himself. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the blood of Jesus Christ, your Son, shed for our sins on Calvary's cross. We thank you that your word declares that by grace we're saved through faith and that not of ourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You freely gave us your Son. He freely offers unto us eternal life. Father, I pray that if there is anyone here tonight who has never placed his or her faith in Christ alone, that tonight he or she would do so with an open heart, recognizing that coming to the foot of the cross, the burden of sin rolls away. That coming to Christ, your sacrifice for sin, gives eternal life, for he is no longer dead but risen from the dead. Father, I pray that even now in the quietness of this moment as we lift our hearts before you, all of us might come confessing our sins, for we know that the blood of Christ not only forgives our sins, but the blood of Christ purges our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. It's not an excuse for us to continue in sin. What, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? The word of God declares to us. But as we come, we can have our consciences cleansed and enter into a new level of relationship with you in which we serve you day by day, moment by moment, with everything in our thoughts and our words, our actions, our motives, our purposes, our attitudes in life. And so, Father, based on the great access that we have, the boldness with which we can come, now through the veil which has been rent to the very throne of grace, we come confessing our sins, knowing that you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, to cleanse our consciences that we might serve the living God. We thank you in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior. Amen.